From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John, this is Harry Branson of Philadelphia Mutual. Harry, what are you doing in town? I'm not. At least not in your town. But you've got a case for me. Do you know anything about violins? Oh, don't tell me. So he opened up his fiddle case and out came a submachine gun, that it? John, that technique went out with prohibition. Now, seriously, this case contains a genuine Amati. Good. What's an Amati? One of the finest, most expensive violins ever made. This one was insured for $30,000. Was? Yes. Now, someone has to find it for us. What's more? Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item one, 1240, train fare and incidentals to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I took the train because Harry Branson didn't seem to be in any particular hurry, and I kind of like a slow look at the countryside this time of year. When I got to Philadelphia, I checked in at the Bellevue Stratford, shaved and showered, then went over to Harry Branson's office in the Security First building on Walnut Street. You deceived me, John. I thought when we talked long distance that you'd be here right away. But instead of flying down, Old you took the sober train. sides Branson Possibly hadn't a changed a bit. Time, I hair a little grayer than the last I time I'd know, seen him, perhaps. I hear further from but still the same here. serious lad who always anything, acted as though he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Now, I feel a deep personal concern over the whole matter because it was a man I put in this office myself who issued the policies, both of them. Two policies on this fiddle you were talking about? No, John, one on the Amati violin, $30,000. Yeah. And one on Ricardo Amerigo himself for $20,000. Who is Ricky? Who? Well, isn't that what you said his name is? I'm sure I didn't mention anyone by the... Oh, 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 Ricardo Amerigo, yes, yes. Well, uh, where's he playing? The Purple Cat or uh, maybe Wee Willie's joint over on John, this, this man is a concert violinist, or was. He's disappeared. Now, please, no more levity. <laughs> Sorry, Earl. It's Harrison. Sorry, Harry. All right. I'm quite all right. Now, I, I realize that you have quite a sense of humor, John, but in a matter as important as this... Yeah, sure. Now, let's have the story. <laughs> Very well. A few years ago, Ricardo Amerigo was one of the world's leading concert violinists, as famous in London, Paris, Rome, as in the concert halls of this country. Uh -huh. Such virtuosity, almost unbelievable. I shall never forget one evening here in our Academy of Music. He had just finished a perfectly brilliant Vinyovsky. Amazing technical performance. Yeah, well... And uh... for an encore, he played Sarasate Zapatiado. Even more brilliant. Harry... Uh... But the audience wouldn't let him leave the stage. Ricardo Amerigo... Has disappeared. Oh, oh, yes. And you're in a hurry to get on with the case. I'm sorry. Now, thinking of his superlative performance that night carried me away for... <clears throat> yes, he, he's dead. Disappeared. And the violin? No trace. Dead? He didn't say that before. I know. You see, there's no proof of death. No body. Disappeared. Well, uh, don't let me shock your finer sensibilities, Harry. Murder? We have thought of that, of course. Who's we? The Port Morris police. Port Morris, New Jersey, that is. Oh. Yes, you see, since Amerigo's car went through the bridge rail, crashed right through it and plunged into the river stream... Trying to tie Harry down to pertinent facts Morris that would help me in my investigation was, uh, well, futile. At least three times during the next half hour, he went off on glowing descriptions of violin recitals he had known. Heifetz, Selman, Chrysler, and so on. But he did come up with one or two things I wanted. First... Amerigo and his fiddle had been driving down from Philadelphia to some spot on the South Jersey seashore. Crossing an old wooden bridge over a little stream, an inlet from the ocean, the car had smashed through the guard rail and gone to the bottom of the inlet. The car, of course, was found. Amerigo and his violin, no. Second, and just as important, the name of the beneficiary of Amerigo's policies. Item two on expense account, one dollar even. Taxi to the Harnell Building, also on Walnut Street, in the office of Peter Corbin, Amerigo's booking agent. The building was plush, but Corbin's office was about as bare as I'd ever seen. An old beat-up desk, a battered filing cabinet, and a couple of straight chairs. That was it. Come in, Dollar. Come in. Sit up. Sit up. Corbin was chewing the stub of a cigar that he'd forgotten to relight for at least a couple of days. We made with the usual howdy doos Well, your man Branson told you exactly right, Dollar. I'm Ricardo Amerigo's sole and only beneficiary. Well, isn't that have been unusual for a man's agent to be his heir... Or, uh, was it because you were all personal friends? I'm going to give it to you straight. 
I brought him where he go over to this country. Myself, my own sole expense. I actually gave him the build-up. I started his whole entire career. I kept him on top, all at my own expense. Well, didn't you collect a regular agent's commission on his earnings? Oh, sure, sure. Plenty more. Why kid about it? Sure, while he was working. What's that supposed to mean? Bottle. What? Yeah, started hitting the bottle. Bad, not good. And believe me, the word gets around fast. Instead of making me money, himself too, of course, he started costing me money. But you see, he never saved anything, even when he was earning big. You know how these artists are. Yeah, I've heard. Well, it's the same with all of them. He got in debt actually up to his ears. And nobody, no, no family, no relatives, nobody to pull him out. Nobody but me. Big-hearted Corbin. So you had him take out a lot of insurance and name you as beneficiary? Well, that was his idea, actually. Of course, he always did have the Amati insured. That's his violin. Oh, so I learned. Oh, you know about violins? No. Oh. Well, but the life insurance, that was his own idea. Double indemnity, all that sort of stuff. Double indemnity? Oh, yeah. But guess who had to dig up the moolah for the last couple of premiums? <laughs> Big-hearted Corbin. You're right. Not a bad investment, though, was it? What? Hey, hey, couple wait of thousand a in premiums, and you stand to collect plenty. If we can find proof that he's dead, and if we can't oh, recover the... I don't like the... that dollar. I don't either, Corbin. It doesn't smell good. Oh, you think me, his own agent, actually rigged something like that for one of my best friends? You think that... Listen, wise guy, even if I did have any, any of a such idea, it'd be crazy. Anything actually is, is, is as obvious as that. Well, sometimes the most obvious is the best cover. Oh, get out of here, Dollar. Unless you want somebody to start collecting on your insurance. Even if it isn't you, huh? Get out! So help me. Yeah, pretty obvious. And every time you open your mouth... Oh, oh no, you don't. <laughs> Why is it that people who telegraph their punches are always the first to start swinging? Eh, I don't know. Anyhow, I left Corbin to pick himself up and start thinking about some alibis he might need. And in the camp back to my hotel, I did a lot of thinking myself. Sure, the obvious off times is the best cover-up. And yet it might be too obvious. Far too obvious. Branson here. Johnny Dollar here. Oh, uh, John, good. Listen, at least there'll be no double indemnity to pay in the Amerigo matter. For accidental death, that is. You see... Wait a minute. About an hour ago, you weren't even sure he's dead. Did somebody find the body? It, no, unfortunately, but I've just received a call from the Port Morris police. They completed their examination of Amerigo's car. Uh, after they pulled it out of the creek, of course. I hope so. John, they found conclusive evidence of murder. Harry, I'll call you from Port Morris. <laughs> Expense account, item two. Subway, ferry, train, and bus fares to South Vineland, New Jersey. South Vineland, because Ad Bowles lived there, and I knew that if anything, anything at all happened in the heart of sunny southern Jersey, Ad would know about it. Retired and raising some of those wonderful South Jersey sweet potatoes and peaches with plenty of hired help, he amused himself by moseying around, getting to know everybody and everything that happened in his section of the state. He had an insatiable curiosity and money enough to keep it satisfied. Hi, you conniving, chiseling son of a gun. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to get here. What took you so long? Hey, what was that conniving, chiseling crack, son? We're still on expense account, aren't you? Yeah, sure. Sure, but... and so help me, nobody in history ever had the knack of padding out an expense account the way you can. And collect those fancy commissions on top. Hi, when I was a private investigator... Who is retired? <laughs> You call this retired 270 acres of sandy soil from which to try to wrestle the poor oh, living? Oh, no, wait a minute. That, that Cadillac El Dorado out front, that belongs to one of the hired hands. 983 right? peach trees. And isn't that a landing field I see out there through the window? A lot of sweet potato land to be cultivated. Well, yes. Say, why didn't you fly down or let me know and I'd have picked you up? Look, with all the time I have on oh, my hands... I thought hand, you said you were very yeah, busy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how long are you going to stay so I can figure out where we'll go, uh, what we'll do? Ed, I'm on a case. Well, sure. Ricardo Amerigo and his priceless fiddle. Oh, no. It was easy. When I heard about him going over the bridge, I contacted Barney Peters of the Port Morris PD. From Barney, I learned all about the next of kin. It, his agent, that is. Pete Corbin. Right. And that boy at Philadelphia Mutual, Harry Branson. And I knew Branson wouldn't call anybody but you in on the case... So, here you are. Still a private eye, aren't you, Ed? <laughs> you gotta have some way of killing time. And I suppose you have the whole case solved. Yep. 
Well, according to Harry Branson, who heard from the Port Morris police just before I left Philly, it was murder. Oh, you point killer. I thought I'd be the one to tell you that. No, sorry. The cops knew it first. Second, I told them. Huh? Yeah, I showed them where somebody'd used a hacksaw on the steering arm of Amerigo's car when they dragged it out of the creek. Uh Uh-huh, so that was it. Yep. And who wielded the hacksaw? Pete Corbin. Who else? Why? Who else stood to benefit by Amerigo's sudden trip to the great beyond? Ah, no, no, no. It's too easy, Ed. What's more, he's the only one who had constant and complete access to Amerigo's car. Why, he not only mothered little Ricky, clothed and fed him and kept him in booze, but he paid his rent, swept out his apartment, serviced his car. That's too easy. And Johnny, that car was even kept locked in Pete Corbin's own garage. And Corbin had the only key. Where did you learn that? From Corbin's landlord, by phone, of course. Said he thought Corbin did that so Ricky couldn't go out driving when he was drunk. And me... I think it was the other way around. He'd only let him drive when he was drunk, huh? Instead of a good chance of smashing up what would look like accidental death. So that Corbin would collect the double indemnity. It's open and shut. (laughs) Any proof, Sherlock? Ha! Just get to Corbin, throw it all at him, and break him down. Maybe he'll even find the hacksaw tucked up his sleeve. Uh, Too easy. Any bets that it isn't Corbin? Yeah, yeah, I'll bet you. You name it. My commission on the case. I'll match it. Oh, and uh, plus your expense account. Look, Ed, I want to see that car and the bridge and the creek, anything else I can find. Sure, sure, I'll fly you down there. Then we can go on over to Atlantic City, hit some of the night spots. Your treat, you know, so we can build up the expense account enough for me to collect plenty. Ed Bowles had been a pretty good investigator in his day. Seldom gone off half-cocked. Yet all his evidence was purely circumstantial. And where was the body? What's more, Pete Corbin acted anything but scared. Or so I thought until I put through a routine call to Harry Branson. He was worried. He had a right to be. Pete Corbin had packed a bag, jumped into his car, and disappeared. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a soggy day in a soggy South Jersey swamp. And a discovery almost too good to be true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.